Well, good evening and many thanks for the invitation uh, to speak at uh, Livingston. Uh, I've been studying in the book of Revelation, interesting, fascinating book, at times quite difficult just to get your head around some of the material that's in it, of course, but I found it surprisingly practicable and surprisingly helpful, uh, even although uh, there is uh, so much uh, in the way of complexity and depth to the the, the passages. Now, I'm going to turn to Revelation chapter number four, uh, a section that perhaps has more of an immediate impact on where we are uh, today because it's a section that speaks of heaven, and I'm sure that that is of interest to us all. And uh, uh, let's read what the Apostle uh, John says here in Revelation chapter four, and we read from verse one. <clears throat> and after this I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was, as it were, of a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up hither, and I will show you things which must be hereafter. And immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. And he that sat was to look upon like a jasper and a sardine stone, and there was a rainbow round about the throne in sight like unto an emerald. And round about the throne were four and twenty seats, and upon the seats I saw four and twenty elders sitting, clothed in white raiment, and they had on their heads crowns of gold. And out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices, and there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. And before the throne there was a sea of glass like unto crystal, and in the midst of the throne and round about the throne were four beasts full of eyes before and behind. And the first beast was like a lion, the second beast like a calf, the third beast had a face as a man, and the fourth beast was like a flying eagle. And the four beasts had each of them six wings about him, and they were full of eyes within, and they rest not day and night, saying, Holy, Holy, Holy Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. And when those beasts give glory and honour and thanks to him that sat on the throne, who liveth forever and ever, the four and twenty elders fall down before him that sat on the throne and worship him that liveth for ever and ever, and cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honour and power, for thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. And we do look to God to bless his word uh, to us this evening. Well, uh, Revelation chapter 4, an unusual chapter, of course, in the Bible. Um, I suppose if uh, you had never ever uh, seen a Bible before, if you can imagine that. And I was to hand you this book all wrapped up in cellophane, uh, fresh from the press, never read. And I was to tell you that this book was the book of God. I wonder what you would expect to be in that book. I suppose it would be reasonable to expect that the book of God would have much in it concerning God. That would seem to be fairly self-evident, and you would not be disappointed. Now, the Bible does indeed uh, speak much about God. It tells us who he is, tells us what he did. It tells us that he is creator, of course, right at the beginning. It tells us uh, that he is the lawgiver, the definer of righteousness, that righteousness and uh, law is not subjective. It's not simply the imagination of men that create order in the moral or in the physical universe, but rather uh, right and wrong is ordained and finds its origin in God. And we would learn, of course, too, that he is the ultimate judge of all men. And perhaps surprisingly, maybe even astoundingly, we would read, too, that it is possible that the one who is so offended by our sin is also the one who is able to save and who has moved in a very, in an infinitely gracious way towards us in the giving of his son. And so we'd read much about the character of God his holiness, his righteousness, uh, his authority, his absolute power, omnipotence, the fact that he is all-knowing. We read about his, his, uh, his uh, work of creator and redeemer uh, and judge and saviour. Uh, I suppose, too, if I was to give you this book of God and you were to, uh, I was to ask you what might be in it, then, then yeah, uh, God that would be the subject, I'm sure, that would come to mind. But if you're anything like me, I, I suspect you would anticipate that this book from the Creator would tell me something about myself. For after all, that is very much 
uh, a subject that is dear to my heart. Uh, I want to know where I came from. I want to know if I'm just as some of these philosophers claim, just the product of random, merciless, pitiless chance. Is that all I am? Uh, just a collection of atoms that ultimately will dissipate meaninglessly in a universe. Uh, of course, the Bible uh, puts a completely different perspective on life, uh, on meaning, and tells me that I am created and originate from the hand of God, and ultimately that I will stand before him. Perhaps too you would anticipate that this book would tell you something about the obsession of our, our secular society in its media, uh, you know, angels and demons. It seems to be that our society very much ignores God, has little interest in God, but seems to have, strangely enough, a pretty big obsession with the occult, the demonic. And uh, the Bible will tell you a little about that too. But perhaps... You would anticipate, as I would anticipate, that in the book about God, uh, that this book would tell us about heaven. And after all, heaven is a word that is very much used, and people often reference heaven, especially if you're involved, as I quite often am, in taking funerals. You'll find that it is almost a universal belief amongst folks, at least the ones that I'm in contact with, the universal belief that their dear ones uh, have departed to heaven. But the concept, of course, that they have of heaven is very, very different from the biblical concept. Uh, heaven in the popular imagination seems to be a place where the interests of earth continue, uh, where friends meet up with friends, uh, where almost uh, some of the, the sins of earth are perpetuated, bizarrely. Uh, that, of course, is the heaven of popular imagination. It's not the heaven of divine revelation. And this book does tell us a little about heaven, but the surprising thing is it doesn't tell us that much about heaven. There's certainly a chapter in Isaiah, um, the smattering of verses uh, through uh, the Psalms. It depends, I suppose, what you make of Ezekiel as to what you would categorize there as heaven. Uh, but uh, apart from that, not an awful lot said about the specifics of heaven in the Bible until you reach Revelation chapter number four. We've waited a long time, really, to learn about heaven. Uh, we finally got to the end of this great volume of books, this Bible. Bible, of course, really is the English transliteration of the Greek Biblios, uh, which means books. So we've got to the end, not just of the book, but of the books, of the 66 books. Uh, we've got to the revelation, in the revelation of God. And you remember, too, that John tells us in John 1, that this book of Revelation is the revelation of Jesus Christ. So you finally got to the revelation of the revelation of the revelation. And finally, you've got a glimpse into heaven. Revelation chapter 4, where we are this evening. I think having waited so long then uh, in reading through our Bible to finally get a glimpse into heaven, I think one of the most surprising things about heaven, in Revelation 4 anyway, is that heaven is not that surprising. Hmm. Let me explain. Revelation 4 tells us a little about heaven. Uh, let's have a look at the things uh, that John tells us about this place. And let me tell you things that you already know. <laughs> I'm confident that you already know everything that I'm going to tell you. Not because you've studied Revelation 4 before, necessarily, but because you know it from elsewhere. But it's interesting to see the way that John brings it together in a very fresh way. So John tells us then about this place of heaven in verse number one. After this, I looked and behold, a door was opened in heaven. And so the first thing that I learn about heaven is this. It has a door. It has a door. Uh, and uh, perhaps, uh, well, perhaps you'll tell me, well, Stuart, I, I, I know that it has a door. I know that it has a door. In fact, it's John who tells us, isn't it, in his gospel that heaven has a door. You'll remember that, I'm sure, from John chapter 10 and, and verse number 9, uh, that there uh, John tells us, uh, of course, the Lord Jesus Christ tells us in the uh, gospel of John, I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved. You see, I know that heaven has a door. In fact, I know from John's gospel who that door is. It's the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, John, uh, in his gospel, and here in Revelation 4 verse 1, uh, we find that heaven has a door. And uh, that, of course, I'm sure comes as no surprise to you. And that door, of course, is the person 
of the Lord Jesus Christ. That would remind us that whilst there is access uh, to heaven, uh, there is selective access. It is, of course, uh, there in John 10 and 9, and later, of course, as well, in John 14, 6, that we uh, understand that there is exclusive access to heaven through the Lord Jesus. You'll remember his words, of course, to his disciples as he returns to heaven to prepare a place for them, uh, that I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. And so heaven has a door. And you knew that, of course, and you knew, of course, who the door was. Not only that, but you notice too that there is a voice. Uh, verse number one, and after this I looked, and behold, the door was opened in heaven, and the first voice which I heard was, as it were, of a trumpet talking with me, which said, come up hither, and I will show you things which must be hereafter. And so uh, in heaven there is a voice, a voice as of a trumpet. Now if you were to go through the Bible, you would find that uh, the uh, trumpet uh, sounds many, many times, uh, especially in the Old Testament scriptures. Uh, it's a very common instrument. It's a, an instrument often used to warn or to wake or, or to alert. Uh, it's an instrument that we'll call to watch and to war. Uh, and sometimes even to worship, uh, and it appears very, very frequently. But uh, the idea of uh, a voice as a trumpet, that's not so common, interestingly enough. You'll find it in about three occasions, in fact, uh, a voice as of a trumpet. Uh, Isaiah makes mention of it, um, and uh, you'll find it particularly in Exodus. Exodus 19, uh, as uh, God would speak from Mount Sinai, it is uh, with uh, or against the background uh, of a voice as, a, as of a trumpet. And then you'll find it again in Revelation chapter number one, as the Lord Jesus Christ speaks, and he speaks there uh, with a voice as of a trumpet. And so uh, that voice uh, as of a trumpet is often linked with the voice of God, and uh, so too here in Revelation 4. In fact, if you were to go back to Revelation and chapter number 1, perhaps we'll just turn back to it, won't we? Uh, Revelation chapter number 1 and verse 10 says, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and heard behind me a great voice, as of a trumpet, saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last and what thou seest right in the book, and so forth. So that's clearly the voice of the Lord Jesus. So the voice in Revel Revelation chapter 4 in heaven is the voice of the Lord Jesus. You see, there's a door. The door is the Lord Jesus. There is a voice. It is the voice of the Lord Jesus. You say, well, I'm not surprised at that, Stuart. I'm not surprised at that, and I'm sure you're not. But maybe, too, you, you would notice that the very first voice that John hears, of course, in heaven is the voice of of the Lord Jesus. And if you were to go back uh, through Revelations chapters 1 through to 3, you would find, of course, there that he hears the same voice. Perhaps we could put it like this, that the very first voice that John hears in heaven was the very last voice that he heard on earth. And maybe in your mind, you're going back to what the Apostle Paul taught uh, the Thessalonians in the fourth chapter there of First Thessalonians chapter 4. It was something very, very similar, wasn't it? That for many believers, that the very last voice that they will hear upon earth is the very first voice that they will hear upon heaven as that voice uh, sounds uh, like a trumpet. Well, heaven is a place uh, which is open to us by the door, by the Lord Jesus. And it is a place where we hear his voice. And you say, well, I kind of knew all of that. Well, let me tell you something else that I'm sure you know. In verse 2, it says, And immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. And so the next thing that we learn here in Revelation 4 is that, the, that heaven is the throne room of God. It is the place where God reigns, where God rules. It's a place of God's sovereignty, uh, of God's kingship. You say, well, <laughs> I knew that from a child. I, 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 I remember learning, uh, maybe at Sunday school, perhaps even at school in the days when the things of the word of God were taught at school. Uh, perhaps you remember, as I did, being taught the Lord's Prayer. And you see, it is within the body of that prayer that the Lord Jesus Christ taught his disciples. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. You say, well, I understood even then from a child that when God reigns and when God extends his rule, he extends it from heaven 
to earth. Heaven is the source of divine authority. Heaven is where God rules and reigns. Heaven is the place of perfection, of authority, of righteousness and of holiness. And we pray that that will extend to earth one day. Well, uh, here we see that throne in heaven. So I, I, I've told you a lot that you already know that there is a door into heaven. Uh, that door, John identifies for us, or the Lord Jesus Christ identifies for us, better to say, in John's gospel as being himself. That the voice that we hear is the voice of the Lord Jesus, that's no surprise. And that, the, uh, that heaven itself is the throne room of God. Well, let us get a little glimpse then of who it is that would sit upon that throne. And we have him there, don't we? In verse number three. And I think it is a very strange uh, description in many ways uh, of the one that sits upon the throne. I, I suppose if you were to turn to a passage of the Bible and I was to tell you that here we get a glimpse of God, here we get a description of God, I suspect, well at least I am anyway, I would suspect you'd be very surprised if he was described in terms of stones. That's a very strange description of God. I'm sure uh, you would agree with me. But we've got it here in verse 3, and as John would seek to describe to us this great vision, this glimpse of the glory of God upon the throne, he describes him in terms of stones. And verse 3 says, And he that sat was to look upon like a jasper and a sardine stone. And there was a rainbow round about the throne in sight, like unto an emerald. Now that's the strangest description, surely, of the God of heaven in terms of these two stones, a jasper and a sardine stone. Now, these are interesting stones, of course, because you will find them elsewhere in the Bible. Uh, you'll find both of those stones, in fact, coming together in one other place, uh, back in the book of Exodus in chapter number 28. Uh, you'll find them there on the breastplate of the high priest. And you remember, I'm sure, that in uh, Old Testament days that uh, the um, nation of Israel, they weren't free to come before the presence of God. They weren't free to speak to God. Uh, they had to have someone who did that for them, and he was their priest or their high priest, of course, once a year in particular, came into the presence of God on the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur. And on that day, he would bear this breastplate, just a square uh, piece of cloth, really, on his chest. And on it, uh, there, was, um, there were 12 stones that were uh, put into that plate on on the piece of cloth on the front of his 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 chest, and uh, these twelve stones, of course, they had something written on them, and that may be helpful for us as we come to verse three of Revelation four. Because what I want to do is just to have a look at what is written on those stones. Maybe that would help us to understand what these stones mean. And on that breastplate, you would find these two stones, as we mentioned in verse three, the jasper and the sardine stone. You would find the jasper as the twelfth of the twelve stones on the breastplate of the high priest. And you would find the sardine stone as the first of the stones on the breastplate of the high priest. Now, on each of those stones, you would find something written. It was a name. It was a name of the tribes of Israel. Uh, because these 12 stones represented the 12 tribes, or the 12 sons of Jacob. And really what was happening is the high priest went into the presence of God once a year with this breastplate and the 12 stones, was that he was really bearing his people before God. He had them, as one person put them, on his heart. And he also, by the way, had them on his shoulders. So he carried them on his shoulders. He carried his people by his strength. And he also bore them on his heart. A lovely picture, isn't it, of the high priestly ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ as he bears us up by his strength when we feel our weakness and he carries us uh, close to his affection and his heart. Well, on the jasper and the sardine stone were names. On the jasper, the twelfth of those stones, you would find the name Benjamin, Benjamin. Benjamin, Benjamin, son of my right hand. And on the uh, sardine stone, you would find the name Reuben, Reuben, uh, the uh, first of the 12 tribes of Israel, Reuben, literally meaning behold a son. 
Now, perhaps uh, you would remind me that that uh, name, Benjamin, that you would find in the Jasper Stone, Benjamin, that was actually, interestingly enough, uniquely uh, the name of one of the tribes, a tribe who had previously had a different name. That's pretty unusual. In fact, that's unique amongst the 12 tribes because Benjamin originally was called Benoni, son of my sorrow. And you'll remember the story that in childbirth uh, to Rachel, she died giving birth to Benoni and she called him son of my sorrow. Uh, but his father didn't leave him with that name. He had higher hopes and aspirations for the boy than to be left with the name of sorrow, and he called him son of my right hand. And so uh, upon that stone, we've got a reminder of a name, the son of my right hand, who was once the son of his mother's sorrow. And on the other stone, the sardine stone, Reuben, behold, a son. And so here we have a description, a, a little picture being painted for us of the one who sits upon that throne. And can you see him? I'm sure I don't, I, I don't need to interpret any of that for you. But seated upon the throne, son of my right hand, the one who at once was the son of his mother's sorrow. And you and I could say, behold, a son. You see, Seated upon the throne is the Son of God, the eternal Son of God. Seated upon the throne is your Saviour and my Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ. Just say, I knew that, I knew that. I, I know that you know that. So I, I'm not telling you anything that you don't know, am I? I'm telling you that in heaven there is a door, that there is a voice in heaven that's the voice of your Saviour. And seated upon the throne, the place of sovereign authority, is the Lord Jesus Christ. And you're getting a, a little picture of heaven. And actually, do you know what? It's not of any surprise to you at all, for you know indeed that all of these things are so. Well, let's perhaps move uh, a little down uh, the section a bit. I'm not going to say too much about the four and twenty elders. Uh, they're interesting. I think you'll find that they have crowns uh, like kings. And I think two of these uh, 24 elders are ordered according to the priestly orders of First Chronicles 24. So these are kings and priests. And you'll find later on in chapter 5 that they're redeemed to God by the blood of the Lord Jesus. So these are believers, I think, um, or at least uh, symbolical believers before the throne. I'm not going to say too much about them, but if you were to drop down perhaps to verse 6, I did want to speak a little uh, about this interesting picture we have a little later on of the crystal sea and uh, of these four living creatures full of eyes. Now, we've seen a, a wonderful picture of glory uh, and of splendor, a wonderful picture uh, of the centrality of the person of the Lord Jesus in heaven, for heaven is all about Christ. Heaven is the place uh, uh, in which we find the person. It is the person that makes the place, isn't it? In my Father's house are many mansions. It is the person that makes the place. And uh, as we move down through the section, uh, we want to perhaps just get a little uh, glimpse of what lies around the person in that place. And we notice there in verse 6 that before the throne there was a sea of glass like unto crystal, and in the midst of the throne and round about the throne were four beasts full of eyes before and behind. Well, what is all that about, the crystal sea? You'll find it, of course, spoken of, won't you, in some of our hymns, uh, the crystal sea. Uh, I think perhaps to understand that uh, description that we have there in verse 6, we have to really go back uh, into the Old Testament uh, of the Bible. Uh, go back to a rather strange description that we have in First Kings. You would find it in chapter 7, in fact. It's... Uh, a detail concerning uh, the temple of Solomon. Now, when Solomon built his temple, uh, you would find that he he paralleled, more or less, uh, the preceding tabernacle. Uh, and everything that was in the tabernacle basically was reflected uh, with something in the temple. So it, it was it was in a sense a copy, but generally speaking, uh, Solomon made things bigger. He made things bigger, but everything seemed to correspond one for one, uh, or at least uh, they paralleled one another. So for example, the Ark of the Covenant was transferred over from the tabernacle and that became the Ark of the Covenant in the temple. You would find that the table of showbread, there was one in the, the tabernacle and a bigger one, actually, 
but it was in the temple. You would find too that the altar of incense, well there was one in the tabernacle, and so too there was an altar of incense in the temple, but a bit bigger. You would find that the uh, altar of burnt offering, the sacrificial altar, well Moses had one in the tabernacle, and so too uh, did Solomon, but it was also much, much bigger. Uh, but nonetheless there was that parallel. There was one thing, though, that uh, interestingly, intriguingly, Solomon changed. Uh, and that was the item that we often refer to as the lever, the lever. In the tabernacle, there was a lever, and that was for the washing, for ceremonial washings of the priest. But when you come to Solomon's temple, he didn't, he didn't replicate that lever with a lever. He replicated it with something that is referred to uh, back in 1 Kings chapter 7 as the sea, the sea. Now that's very strange, and, and when I read that uh, some time ago, you know, when I first looked at uh, Solomon's temple, I was quite intrigued by this. A sea is a strange thing to call it. A lever I could just about get my head around. I had to look up what lever meant, but you know, I, I could understand something you know, for washing, maybe a bath or, uh, or some kind of... Uh, some kind of receptacle for, for washing, but, but to call it a sea seemed very strange to me. And I wondered at the time when I was reading it and studying it, if maybe it was just a, a strange translation. But no, if you look at the Hebrew word that was used to describe that place for the washing of the priests in Solomon's temple, the Hebrew word is the word for sea. So it's a strange, strange thing to call it, isn't it? To call that place a sea. Uh, and of course, you have to wait, really, don't you, till Revelation 4 before you begin to understand why in Solomon's temple there was a place of washing called the sea. You remember that it is the writer to Hebrews that reminds us that uh, when Moses was originally given the blueprint for the tabernacle, that it was according to the fashion of heavenly things. It was a parallel or a parabell, uh, parable of heaven that was reflected in the tabernacle. So to the temple, the things that were seen there in the house of God, tabernacle and temple, were a reflection of the order of things in the heavens. And so when you go later on in the book of Revelation, you'll find that incense is pictured as being offered from the altar, like the altar of incense in the tabernacle and temple. There's something like that in heaven, at least in a spiritual sense. And, uh, that perhaps then would help us to understand why there is a sea in the temple, because there is a sea in heaven. And there's a connection between the two. The sea in the temple was for washing, for purity. It was a place of purification, a place for outward holiness, to remove defilement and uncleanness, to make sure that the priest was in the right condition for moving towards the presence of a God who was of holier eyes and to behold iniquity. Well, Revelation 4 takes us into heaven. And in Revelation 4, 6, before the throne, there was a sea of glass like unto crystal. We have the sea. But this sea isn't for washing. It couldn't be for washing. It couldn't be for cleansing because it's made of glass, crystal glass. There's a connection, though, between the temple and between uh, heaven and Revelation 4, that just as the sea in the temple was a place that uh, echoed of holiness, so too the sea is a place that reminds us of holiness. But this isn't about the provision for holiness. This isn't about the provision for cleansing. You can't be cleansed here. Cleansing's in the past now. This is a statement of the crystal clear purity of God's heaven. This is a statement of the absolute holiness in the presence of God. Something that is stated perhaps more uh, clearly at the end of the book of Revelation, we were reminded that nothing that defiles shall enter therein. Here is a statement of holiness that is the standard, that is the condition, that is the norm for heaven. Nothing that defiles has any place in God's heaven. Now, that of course means that heaven is a very different place, doesn't it? From the place that you and I are used with down here. It was our forefathers that recognised that, of course, even in the language that we use 
That word that we use in our English language, heaven, it's a very ancient word. It goes back through the ancient European languages as uh, the Celts and uh, uh, the uh, Germanic uh, tribes and uh, uh, the, the Gaels moved and migrated through Europe and the languages came with them. Uh, that word heaven is a word that appears right the way through the European languages and has remained relatively unaltered for thousands of years. In Saxon, the word is heaven. In Low German, heaven. In Middle German, heaven. In Norse, heaven. In Danish, himmen. In Dutch, hemel. In High German, himmel. In Old English, hoffen. So right the way through all of these European languages, it's more or less the same. And it means a covering, a covering. Our forefathers recognised this, that there's this covering that we call heaven, heaven. That there is something or someone beyond that, but there's an impenetrable barrier between us and heaven. The floor of heaven in Revelation 4 is this crystal clear uh, a statement of absolute holiness and a separation. For the floor of heaven is the ceiling in the sense of earth. Nothing that defiles enters therein. It is the very separation in a sense between the holiness of where God dwells and the place where we dwell. Connected to that throne and that uh, crystal sea round about the throne in verse 6, four living creatures. They're translated as beasts in the authorised text, but better translation would be creatures, living creatures. Full of eyes, verse 6, and the first was like a lion, and the second like a calf, and the third a face as a man, and a fourth like a flying eagle. Uh, four living creatures. I think as we reflect on heaven and the holiness of that place, the separation of that place, uh, there is perhaps... Uh, a tinge of, of sadness uh, about it from our perspective in, on this side of eternity. And what I mean by that is this, that because heaven is what heaven is, uh, because heaven is that place of absolute holiness and perfection, I think it's very clear, isn't it, that not everyone will be there. I think that's clear enough. After all, there is only one way uh, there is only one door. Uh, the way is uh, narrow and the gate is straight. Uh, few there be that find it. Well, here's a little tinge of tragedy, if we could say so in Revelation 4, that uh, for those who miss heaven, uh, there is something very, very tragic in these four great creatures, I think, in verse 7 of Revelation 4. For in these four creatures, we get a little glimpse into the character of God. Now, these are living creatures. They're different from God himself, because later on, uh, you'll find verse 9, those creatures give glory and honour and thanks to him that sat on the throne. So these are creatures that are distinct from God. Um, and yet they seem to have the character of the God of heaven. They have the character of the lion. If you were to go over into Proverbs 30 and 30. Why don't I just flick over and read that for you, actually? There's a lot said about the lion in the Old Testament, but lots and lots of verses that you could turn to. But if I was just to maybe turn to one verse uh, that perhaps just kind of typifies uh, what uh, many verses say, then I think probably Proverbs 30, 30 would be about the best of them that would sum it up. And in Proverbs 30, 30, we read this, A lion which is strongest among beasts and turneth not away for any of the strongest amongst the beasts. And you would find that the lion in the Old Testament in particular is, is peculiarly linked with strength, ferociousness, authority. It is, I suppose, in our own colloquial uh, terminology, it's the king of the jungle. Uh, and that, in a sense, is true too, as you go through the word of God. So the lion in its authority and in its strength uh, a beast like a calf. A calf, what does that tell us about? Well, some would suggest that the calf is the 
animal of service? Well, no, it's not. Definitely not. <laughs> uh, if you look in the New Testament, you'll find there's six references to the calf. Uh, three of them in Luke 15. That's the fatty calf that's slain. And two in the book of Hebrews, where the calf again is sacrificed. And then here in Revelation 4. So in the New Testament, the calf's not so much linked with service, but with sacrifice. Sacrifice. And then there is uh, one with a face as a man. Hmm. Uh, you say, well, how would that connect with God? Of course, it's John that tells us how man connects with God, isn't it? In John's Gospel. That no one has seen God at any time. But the only begotten who is in the bosom of the Father, he has declared him. And the Word became flesh and dwelt amongst us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father. And so there is that character of God here in uh, verse 7. Uh, the character of God in his authority, his sovereignty, his kingship, his power, the line. The surprising sacrificial character of God who provides a way for men and women to be reconciled to him. And a, a God who reveals himself as uh, the person of the Lord Jesus. And the fourth beast as a flying eagle. Uh, a word, the otis, which uh, the word eagle comes from the Greek word for the air, the wind. Um, perhaps a little echo there of the work of the spirit that moves like the wind. You remember the Lord Jesus Christ speaks of that picture of the wind and the spirit back in John chapter 3. You've also got a picture of it in Genesis 1 as the spirit of God moves upon the face of the waters. So, Here's a fourfold picture of the character of God as revealed in the way that he does reveal himself. He reveals himself in his sovereignty. He reveals himself in the sacrificial work of the Lord Jesus. He reveals himself in the humanity of Christ. He reveals himself in his Holy Spirit. Now, here's the tinge of tragedy that perhaps echoes uh, for us today uh, as we consider heaven. And it's this. That whilst it is the case that not all will enter into heaven, it is also the case that God has done everything that we might know him. God is a God who has revealed himself. God is a God who has reached out towards us. God is the God who revealed himself sovereignly down through the pages of history, declaring the end from the beginning that Isaiah would speak about. He's the God who tells us what he will do and then he does it as only a sovereign God can do. He is the God who declares that he will give his son, born of a virgin. He tells us in Micah where he'll be born. He tells us uh, the uh, details of the crucifixion in Psalm 22 and uh, Isaiah 53 and Psalm 69 as well. He tells us about his great work of salvation in Isaiah 53. He tells us that they, they shall look upon me whom they have pierced, says God to Zechariah. And he tells us uh, concerning the wonderful character, the miracles, uh, or, and the, the purity of his son, uh, uh, the Lord Jesus Christ. He tells us about his betrayal. He tells us about the 30 pieces of silver uh, in Jeremiah. He tells us the name of the betrayer, really, in the book of Genesis, as Judah would sell his brother uh, Joseph uh, into slavery. And so God works sovereignly through history. He works sovereignly too in my life and yours. And there are those times, I'm sure, that each of us are aware where such bizarre coincidences happened, when such a, a strange thing occurred that brought something to, to play upon our lives, that brought us into contact in an unusual way, perhaps, uh, with a series of circumstances that utterly transformed our lives. And we see the sovereign hand of God working in our lives. We see, too, that God is a God who has provided a way uh, whereby his banished be not expelled from him forever. He's provided a sacrifice. He's provided the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he has moved and is moving by his Holy Spirit, convicting of sin, righteousness, judgment of cut to come, and revealing the person of the Lord Jesus. And so whilst heaven is a place that is of minority interest, there is this great tragedy, I think, about heaven. And it's this that uh, God has done and extends out uh, to all uh, a revelation in some way of who and what he is. Even if it is that revelation 
uh, even in creation that, jo that Paul would speak about in Rom Romans chapter 1. And so here's a place then, a place of divine sovereignty, of, of divine holiness, a place where Christ is enthroned, a place where the Lord Jesus Christ speaks, a place where indeed there is a door, and a place where God in his character extends even today to men and women an invitation by uh, the person of the Lord Jesus Christ to come through that door and to be with him forever. What a place indeed heaven is. Well, thanks very much for uh, the invitation to share something of God's word with you. I trust that it encourages. Uh, I trust that perhaps it takes our mind a little off the ordinary and lifts our mind a little up into heaven. I uh, trust that it is of some help and encouragement to the believers at Livingston. Thanks very much for uh tuning in and being with me and allowing me to be with you uh, this evening. And if you have, uh, by the way, enjoyed some of the meditations, we're working through that at New Cumnock. I'm not inviting you to New Cumnock, or you could come to New Cumnock if you want, but there are other meditations there on the website. If you're interested at all, graceinchrist.org, you'll find some more studies if you're interested in following up on the book of Revelation. Well, thanks very much uh, for allowing me to be with you tonight. Thank you. <laughs>